Great. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Jack. I'm one of the assistant pastors uh, here at the church looking after youth and students. Guys, I'm super excited uh, to be able to preach this morning because they say if you, if you want to grow in humility, you need to practice preaching to teenagers, which is literally what I've done for years because teenagers will tell you exactly how it is. You get like nothing back. And if you want to grow in humility, you have to preach to English people, because English people will give you nothing back. If you get a nod, like Dan's already nodding, he's where I'm looking all morning. But circuit riders are known for being encouraging when someone's preaching. So I'm looking forward to uh, some encouragement as we go. Yeah, so, uh, we are um, yeah, excited we're going to talk about this morning. Um, I'm just going to pray. Jesus, we just thank you for your word. We thank you. It's living and active. We just pray now you would give us open hearts and minds and spirits that are willing to respond to your word today. Amen. Amen. Hey guys, I want you to imagine uh, you open the post tomorrow morning and you get one of those letters. You know the ones that like really posh paper, like, uh, and it, it looks like really important. And, and you look at the title and it's from some solicitor who can't pronounce their name of. And then you, you read the first few lines and explains that this solicitor specializes in wills and inheritance. And you think, my dream has come true. Uh, this is the day where my millionaire distant uncle has passed on their inheritance to me. It's finally come round. Now, guys, that actually happened to my gran a few months ago. Um, it wasn't a millionaire, unfortunately. But this relative she hadn't seen in 60 years had passed away. And her and her sister were the closest living relatives. And so they got his inheritance. Now, he wasn't a millionaire, but she did get a new bathroom. So, praise God. <laughs> but guys, imagine just for a moment, that was true for you. And the fortune of a billionaire was going to come to you. What would you spend it on? I want you to turn to the person next to you. I'm going to give you 20 seconds. What would you spend your fortune on? Go, you've got 20 seconds. Okay, I said 20 seconds, you've had 20. Has, has anyone, they sat, person they sat next to, said something absolutely outrageous that they want to... Anyone said anything outrageous? I mean, Lamborghinis in the room, wild cars. What? A helicopter? Come on. Okay, I said one more. What's the best one you've heard? Shout out. The best thing you'd spend your money on? Private jet. Private jet. Come on, wouldn't it? Now, imagine, imagine, though... You're going to get this inheritance, but there's some strange clause that they put in the will, which means you can't receive that money for 10 years. For 10 years. But would it change how you lived your life? You're going to get this massive inheritance, this promise is coming for you, but it's 10 years away. And it probably would, wouldn't it? you probably change, you've got this expectation of something coming. Imagine it wasn't 10 years, but 20 you know, 20 years time now, I've got this massive gift. It doesn't change your life now, but 20 years time is this amazing thing that's going to happen. What if it was 40 years? I guess I'm looking around the room. We're starting to get into dangerous, dangerous territory. 40 years. Okay, what if it was, what if it was 70? That your family are going to receive this massive inheritance, but it's 70 years away. Let's be honest, except for some of the kids upstairs, like we're never seeing that money. We're never seeing that money. It would simply pass to your children, your grandchildren, and your great-grandchildren. And the reality is you would never materially benefit from this promise. Your life might not change at all. And yet you would know that your family and the world they're about to live in would be radically different once that promise was fulfilled. Would it change how you parented if you had kids? Would it change what you taught them? Would it change how you trained them to live? Like how you approached money? How you taught them about the world and poverty and justice and fairness? Would it change how you taught them about maintaining your faith in God despite 
having huge wealth. I know for me, it would certainly sharpen my focus as to what it would mean to leave a legacy. As we're going to look at a, a passage of scripture where God's people received an amazing promise. Uh, it's so amazing, in fact, that this promise has been put on Christian coffee mugs and doormats for decades. In fact, I forgot to get it out. One second. In perfect timing, my friend recently went to Israel, and you can get, I hope she's not watching, because these are amazing. Thank you for blessing me with these. Uh, Jeremiah 2911 socks with the scroll and everything. I didn't even know, like, is that a thing? Like, so Jeremiah 2911, for those of you who don't know it, says, um, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. And you can see why we put it on everything of Christian merch. An amazing promise. But guys, here it is in context, starting from verse 10. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. Then verse 12. You, then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. I will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. Now, today I just want to ask, I want to ask us a question what does it mean to wait for renewal and wait for revival? But to do so with not like some vague hope that it could happen, but with an expectancy that it will happen. And how do we live with an expectancy that even if we never fully get to see the promise fulfilled, we still live in expectancy that our families and our cities and our nation will be changed? Church, I want to unashamedly tell you well, I believe there's no greater calling on the Christian life than to invest in the next generation. And I might be a very biased youth and student pastor. I admit that. But I really believe it to be true, not because it's just my vocation and job, but because no matter your vocation or job, I think we all have a role to invest in the next generation of faith. And this passage will give us some pointers as to what it means to work and build and pray for a blessing you might never personally fully see. As we see some examples in scripture, in Luke, uh, after Jesus is born, his parents take him to the temple. And you meet Anna and Simeon, who God promised would meet the Messiah before they died. And they don't fully get to see the kingdom come, but they get the blessing of seeing the start of that promise. Uh, The House of Prayer, where Rebecca and I uh, were on team for about five years or so uh, in Barnstable, When it first got started, uh, this lady approached the the founding leaders, and and she was in her late 80s, and she walked up to them and said, I've been praying for a house of prayer in Barnstable for 50 years. Now I can go and be with the Lord. Faithfully praying for decades for the promise of God. And guys, there's something striking about that level of perseverance and faithfulness that I think goes really in contrast to the culture we live in. You see, we live in a culture of like immediacy, the culture of like right now. And we live in a time and a place where we've been taught to expect everything instantly. Like instant gratification is how we all live. Just think Amazon Prime, like Netflix series on demand, instant 24 hour news, like uh, information at our fingertips, Deliveroo and Woosh deliveries when we're desperate for something. Food from every season from around the world, whenever and wherever we want it. But if we're not careful, that same attitude can seep into our spirituality. And when we don't get the instant results from our spiritual disciplines, from time and fellowship and prayer and reading the word and fasting and and those things we don't like, when we don't see that transformation instantly, we start to doubt if they work at all. And if you've been, I don't know about you, if you've been walking with Jesus for any length of time, have you ever noticed God doesn't really seem to be on your timescale? Just me? Anyone else? 
I, I don't know about you, but he didn't seem to read my five-year plan correctly. He seems to have a different time scale. And I think that affects how we read the Bible sometimes. You see, we can read the Bible, and you can read a whole book of the Bible, perhaps of an Old Testament prophet, in a matter of minutes. And you can forget that it spans decades and decades of someone's life. And it seems like there's this thing after thing where God shows up, and then this amazing thing's happening, and this miracle happens, and you're like, wow, is that what they live like? And yet there could be 20 years between God speaking one and the other. And in between was just faithful commitment and service. And guys, it is true. God does appear to us in the, those suddenly moments. Like we read scripture and suddenly God appears. Suddenly the angel of the Lord is there. These dramatic encounters. And, and guys, we love those moments. In churches like Vineyard, that's what we're all about. We love experiencing the presence of God, seeing him show up. We love going to those conferences and festivals where we know we're going to encounter God and, and get a prophetic word and be encouraged. And many of us in this room have had those real transformational encounters. But guys, when our faith is built on just those encounters, and we're just waiting just for that next one, like we go to, I used to do it as a teenager, I'd go to Soul Survivor in the summer, have an encounter with God, and it'd be like holding on for 12 months until I could just get back around to the summer, and I'll meet with God back there in that field, in that festival. And guys, if our faith is waiting just for those rare, suddenly moments, our faith will get quite shallow. And it won't be robust when those tough moments in life hit. Whereas I think it should be, it should be both and. You see, those encounters with God in the suddenly moments are they're like an invitation into that daily relationship. And it's a bit like, I was trying to think of an analogy, it's not perfect, but it's a bit like the difference between having surgery and doing physio. You guys might know our senior pastors are physios, they're not here, so I can, I can say what I like and get it wrong, it's fine. But you know when you watch sports and you hear the commentators say about an injury your favorite player's had, and they're like, oh, they're, they're going to need they're gonna need surgery. And saying, by itself, that thing won't heal. Like, the patient doesn't have it within themselves to get better. They need an expert to come in and do something dramatic to transform their body. Surgery is a bit like those dramatic spiritual moments of encountering the Holy Spirit. You experience breakthrough and doing something only that surgeon, that physician, or only the Holy Spirit can do. And physical surgery may be done in a matter, a matter of hours. And once it's done, the patient has been changed. But for that transformation to be applied to real life, for them to get back to doing what they're called to do and able to do, they need months and months of rehab and physio. The daily habits that build on the change in their body. And perhaps without the exercise, without the rehab, without the disciplines, maybe that, that surgery, that transformation work could even be undone. And guys, it's a little bit like our apprenticeship to Jesus. Jesus appears to us in those relatively rare, amazing moments, but they need to be built on with regular rhythms of disciplines, those rhythms of grace that day by day transform us to look like him. And sometimes it's only when you look back over years and years that you see the progress and the transformation that God's done. Okay, so what does this have to do with Jeremiah and the next generation? Well, as I believe in the same way, there are those suddenly moments of encounter for individuals that maybe are built on and applied in, in regular rhythms. I think if you look at church history, there are those suddenly moments of renewal. And you see suddenly moments of awakening of God's church. And when we pray for revival, it's not a biblical word necessarily, but I think that's, it's those moments, those great awakenings, those, uh, re those renewal movements that we have in mind. Like dramatic works of the Spirit, moves of holiness, a move of repentance through the church, and, and unbelievers coming to faith en masse. That's, that's what so many of us long for, for transformation of our communities and cities. I just want to suggest that I think there's, there's three marks of renewals we see in, in church history. There's, there's probably many more, uh, but three I want to highlight. First of all is that I believe every renewal is birthed in fervent and persistent prayer. 
Every move of God throughout church history has been birthed by a move of people committing and desperately seeking God. And guys, so many of those, those prayer movements, that birth renewals, they never saw the promise. Like that 70-year promise in the future, but they saw it. They had eyes of faith to see it, and they committed their lives to intercede. So you look up the story of the Hebrides revival, and just a few older ladies who committed their life to prayer, and an amazing revival resulted. So it starts in fervent and persistent prayer. The second thing is those renewals capture the heart of a young generation. They're almost always marked by young people and students capturing a heart for God and a passion for God in a new way. And the third thing is those ones that last are built on by a movement of discipleship, a movement of committed disciples. And that's the difference between renewals that are a flash in the pan and those that go and change the face of the world. And these promises of Jeremiah 29 are are an interesting example for us. There's this promise of a dramatic move of God. It includes spiritual and physical breakthrough. But it was given to a generation that would never fully experience it. And there was a generation coming who would get to step into it. And their job was to prepare the way. Was to live in such a way of expectation, but to lay the groundwork for that generation to come. Okay, If you've got Bibles, you can turn to it in uh, Jeremiah 29. We'll start from verse, verse 1. So this is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles, to the priests, prophets, all the other people Nebuchadnezzar had carried into Jerusalem, from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jehoiakim and the queen mother, the court officials, the leaders of Judah, Jerusalem, the skilled workers and artisans had gone into exile from Jerusalem. So it's, it's written to the leaders, essentially, and all the people that had gone, the, the people who carried the culture, the political leaders, the business leaders, and the artists. And they'd been taken uh, and violently taken to this other nation of Babylon. And you can read about this story in Daniel 1. Daniel, Daniel is one of those young, uh, young people taken, and he's taken to work uh, for the king of Babylon, and essentially gets put in like occult university for three years to serve the king of Babylon. If you, want con- if you want the context of this, I encourage you that the, uh, the Bible Project video, The Way of the Exile, gives an amazing background to the story. So verse 4. So he's writing it to, to the carriers of Israeli culture, of Jewish culture. In verse 4, this is what the Lord Almighty says to those I carried into exile from, from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses, settle down, plant gardens, and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage, so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there and do not decrease. Seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I've called you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord God Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them. So God is warning his people to be really careful about who they listen to. And if, if you've been taken into captive to a foreign country, guys, wouldn't you want to hear a prophet telling you, don't worry, guys, it's going to be okay. You'll be home soon. That's what you wanted to hear. But God says what you want to hear is not always what God is saying to us in this moment. Uh, Owen will say, our pastor will say that a key to emotional health is understanding and accepting what is. It's therefore a key to spiritual health too. See, God is truth. He's the most real thing there is. So to, for him to be truly known and experienced, we have to live in what's true. And so for those Jews in captivity, they could have believed in the false truth they wished was true. But if they had done that, they would have missed out on their God-given opportunity for the moment. They were called in that time and for that moment. See, guys, we don't get to choose the cultural moment we're in. Just like all of us, we don't get to choose our family of origin, our country of birth, or many of the circumstances we find ourselves in. But we do have control over our response. 
We have a choice as to how we're going to respond to God in that moment. And this generation had this calling to build, settle down, eat, marry, have children, seek the peace and prosperity of their city, and to pray. God instructs them to thrive in the midst of their host culture as they expectantly waited for his promise. He instructed them to live a life centered on Yahweh as, they, as their scriptures had taught them to. But now in the midst of this culture that was dedicated to so many other gods. In the verses 10 to 14, as we read before, the Lord says, Then you'll call to me and come to me. You'll pray and I will listen. You'll seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. God promises a physical return, but he also promises a spiritual return, a calling and seeking of God. It speaks of a generation that would seek after God's heart. The language is like running after, like desperately searching for, giving every effort to run after. I heard a quote this week that history doesn't necessarily repeat itself, but it does rhyme. You see these patterns throughout history. And yes, we should be too careful to apply the Jeremiah 29, 11 verses just to ourselves. But I think we see this pattern all over the story of God. Matthew 6, 33 says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. And in Matthew 6, it says, don't run after, seek after. It's the same word, running, chasing after the things that the, the world does. Instead, seek after, run after, chase after the things of God. See, our world is running after so many things. And you know, the scariest part of the Bible is often God gives us what we ask for. We, can, we have a choice. We can run after all the things the world is chasing after. Or we can live in a different way. You see, we love to know how to live a faithful and fruitful life in the midst of our cultural moment. And I think if we look at uh, our cultural moment of right now, what it means to live in Bristol, in the UK, in the, in the secular West in 2023, I think there's a lot of parallels between where we live right now and where the exiles got sent in Babylon. You see, we um, often read the Bible. We love reading ourselves into the story. And there's a danger sometimes that we read the stories of Israel as a nation and we apply it to our nation of the UK. The thing is, we're not living under a, what's called a theocracy where God is in charge. We don't live any longer in a Christian nation. Actually, uh, the, the secular West is far more like a digital version of Babylon, dedicated to all these other things that are not rooted and based around God. And the cultural world we're swimming in, that we live in, that we think is normal, is something called secular postmodernism. And it's a post Christian culture that wants all the goods, all the moral goods of Christianity, but without any reference to Jesus as the king. So they like God's kingdom, but they didn't like the king. They want all the stuff that came of Christianity, but without having to surrender to somebody else. It's a me centered culture. Whereas Christianity is the opposite. It's an other-centered life. So one centered around him and around giving and sacrificing your life for others. And guys, that is in total opposite to a culture that's about radical individualism. We live in a culture that's so individualistic that people believe they can even choose what truth is. That they can even pick and choose from the spiritualities of the world to make, to make up a spirituality that fits with my life. The reality is, though, when I read the claims of Jesus, they are really specific and sometimes really exclusive. That the only way to salvation, the way, the truth, and the life is through Jesus and the gospel alone. There is no other way. It's not through good works. It's not through any other form of spirituality. It's through giving your life to Jesus. Jesus said in Luke 9, If anyone would be my follower, you must take up your cross daily, deny yourself, and follow me live in his footsteps, in his way of life. And that way of life is a life of sacrifice. That's what it means to take up your cross, to die to yourself. I did my DTS. These guys are from YOM. I did my DTS in 2008. And I still remember the talk where they said DTS stands for die to self. 
And guys, didn't they make us learn it? Oh my gosh. And there we did. But it was amazing. And it's a foundation for my spiritual walk. It changed my approach to following Jesus. And trust me, when I was scrubbing those toilets of our community house, which I lived in with 12 guys, I was just die to self, die to self. But the Christian life is a way of humility. It is an other-centered life, not a me-centered life. Guys, there's so much more we could say in this passage, but what do we do then? As people who find ourselves in a modern-day digital Babylon, as exiles, as people who live differently, how do we respond? How do we wait and work for a renewal in the church and the world around us? Well, guys, I think those three things that marked renewal, I think, can be guides for us. Fervent and persistent prayer, sacrificial investment in the next generation, and a lifestyle of discipleship. It's going to land with these. First of all, prayer. If the Christian life is an other-centered life, not a me-centered life, that should be reflected in how we pray. Because I don't know about you, but how much of your prayer life is focused on my needs, my wants, and my fears? What would it look like to build intercession? It just means to stand in the gap, to pray for others on behalf of others. What would it look like to build more of that into your rhythms? How can we do that more as a, as a church, as our community group, as a triplet? To just have that focus of praying and standing in the gap for others. Guys, some top tips. Maybe sign up for prayer updates from whatever your favorite charity, your justice charity is, your missionaries that you support. Sign up for updates. Get them sent to your phone in your inbox. Just as a reminder to be praying. Set your alarm at the same time of day, every day. Maybe 12 noon. Just as a reminder, and at the moment, no one has to know what it is, just to pray and to pray for someone you know. And keep a list. How many times do you say to someone, yeah, I'm going to pray for you. Yeah, no, I see that knee. I see that person who's sick. I'll pray for you. And then you forget. Every time. I'm like, let's pray now because I know I'll forget. I know what I'm like. But guys, write it down. Have a list. Have an app. Have a, have a note on your, on your phone just to remind you to pray. Okay, second, the next, invest in the next generation. Because 85% of Christians in the UK became one before the age of 18. And yet, less than 2% of young people in the Southwest are in church and less than 1% of students. Guys, what does it look like? We're, we're fortunate as a church to invest in the young generation. But if we're about others and not ourselves, what does it look like to radically sacrifice for the next generation? Guys, the people are open. We've seen so many, probably literally in the last few months, I'd say hundreds of conversations at, at Soho on a Sunday night. For the sake of a 30-second chat and a free coffee, and you can get into a conversation about faith. Young people, the young generation are open. But it doesn't have to be young people. It could be the next generation of faith. The Talking Jesus research says if you asked of your friends, five of them to come to church with you, at least one would say yes. At least one. What would it look like to this year just to pick three, three to five friends and pray for them consistently for opportunities to talk about faith. And guys, by the end of the year, each and every one of us would probably see at least one coming to church. And the third one is disciple making. The Jews found themselves in, an ex- in exile in a culture that lived a different story. But they discovered rhythms of living, of rehearsing the scriptures, of meeting together, of worshipping together, that meant they could live in a different story in the midst of their host culture. The key to discipleship, I think, is always relationship. We see it through the New Testament. And so I've got a really simple challenge for us around our discipleship, our rhythms. If discipleship is passed on through relationships, first question is, who is investing in your spiritual journey? Who are you journeying with? could be a spiritual director, a mentor, a pastor, your community group leader. But is there someone who's further down the journey of faith who's investing in your life? And the second question is, who are you investing in? Discipleship is passed on from generation to generation. So who are you right now investing in the spiritual life of? They may not be a Christian yet, but who are you actively looking to support in their journey towards Jesus? Guys, I just want to leave you with this thought. Revival in the UK may take another 70 years. But even if it is that long until the next suddenly move of God, 
What if your great-grandchildren and grandchildren looked you up and they found stories of a group of believers in Bristol in the 2020s who were fervently praying for renewal, who were investing in the next generation and were making disciples in ex- expectation that the next move of God might be established and spread to the ends of the earth? But what if that move is happening right now? See, 60 years ago, the Jesus People movement swept from California across the world and started the Vineyard Movement. 60 years before that, the Welsh and Azusa Street Revivals birthed the Pentecostal Movement, which now has 500 million members. Around 50 to 60 years before that was the Third Great Awakening. You may have seen reports of God moving in Asbury College in Kentucky. Pete Gregg, the founder of the 24-7 prayer movement, recently visited and said that what he saw was a hunger in the younger generation and a bunch of people, older people, older generations cheering them on. And he said what he saw was a faceless move of God for a generation tired of celebrities, an analog move of God for a generation worn out by digital addiction, and a quiet move of God marked by freedom for a generation plagued by anxiety and addiction. Guys, that sounds like God to me. Guys, we're going to pray. So let's respond to things. What does it look like for, to go deeper and fervent in prayer, to invest in the next generation, and to live a life of discipleship? Guys, can I encourage you to stand? We've been sat for a while. We're just going to say a really simple prayer. You can invite the Holy Spirit to come. And guys, the, uh, the Circuit Rally team will be available to pray. Some of our ministry team will be. So if you want prayer for anything, I'd encourage you to come to the front or the sides and someone will find you and pray for you. So you just say, come Holy Spirit. If you want to hold out your hands and have a posture that's just about receiving, it's not special, but it helps us to focus. So Jesus, would you come? Come Holy Spirit. Guys, I'm just sensing as um, as I was talking that for some of you, maybe when you first came to faith or years gone by, you, you, you think to yourself, oh, I had that passion. I had that vision and that faith for renewal and a move of God. But maybe just over the years, it's just gone a bit cold. That stuff of life, suffering, difficulty, busyness is just crowded in and it just feels like it's, it's more like an ember than a fire anymore. I just feel like there's an invitation from God just to fan that into flame, just for him to fan that fire and that expectancy. And guys, if that's you, I just want to encourage you, maybe put your hand up or, or make yourself known to someone you came with or, or come to the front. I just love to pray that over you. So if that's you, maybe just be bold and no one else is looking, just maybe raise a hand just to signal that towards God. So Holy Spirit, fire of God, we thank you. Yeah, God, that your word says where hope, hope deferred makes the heart sick. I just want to pray for renewal of hope right now across us as a church. Where our hope has gone cold, I just want to speak life in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, make life where those dreams have just gone dormant. Where the vision for families and sense of something on children and grandchildren, there's like a pain in so many of us where we haven't seen our children just pursuing Jesus the way we've hoped and prayed for. God, I pray for renewal of hope right now in Jesus' name. Come, Jesus. More of you, God. I encourage you just to give it to God. If there's pain and anguish, you can take it. The Psalms are full of people being honest with God. Come, Jesus. God, right now, I pray you just birth new and fresh dreams. You and fresh dreams, God. Hope and vision for the future. 